Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. We're your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, we explore a different perspective on or experience of depression because it varies in form and severity, affecting us differently. Our guests share intimate details of their struggles, coping strategies, and recovery. We keep it real because the struggle is real. We keep it hopeful because there is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We're not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and know that talking about the illness reduces stigma and humanizes the experience, making it safer and easier to ask for needed support. You are far from alone. Today's podcast is sponsored with a Garrett Kelly Memorial Grant from the Charles E. Kubley Foundation in loving memory of Garrett and others who've struggled with depression. We are solely responsible for podcast content. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. I want to thank everyone for tuning in because today is our 100th new episode of the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. Yay! Yay! (laughs) And we have learned so much, Terry, Mm -hmm. from our weekly guests. It's just like... The education has been amazing. It's Absolutely. so much more than just information and insights and advice. Mm-hmm. Each also offers us a sense of connection. And that's a reminder that depression is real and that recovery is possible. Mm-hmm. And it's a reminder that we're not alone and that we're not broken. Absolutely. Today's guest is a good reminder of all of that. His name is Brian Dawkins. He played in the NFL for 16 seasons, 13 with the Philadelphia Eagles and three with the Denver Broncos. When he did that, he earned the nickname Weapon X and a reputation as one of the league's hardest hitters. Tough, fearless, strong, resilient. Since leaving football, Brian has refined and redefined those words. It takes personal strength and toughness to use your Hall of Fame induction speech to disclose to the world that you battle depression and nearly lost that fight on occasion. You have to be resilient and face your fears to wave the white flag, to ask for help and to see a therapist, to share what's going on in your head. And it takes a team to help us keep faith in ourselves when darkness threatens our very sense of self. Here's Brian talking with Terry in a candid conversation about their experiences with depression. I want to start by thanking you because so many celebrities seem to use their powers to uh, promote themselves. And the fact that you are choosing to draw attention to depression and suicidal thoughts and what you call cerebral wellness makes me deeply grateful. So I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is, uh, this is one of my purposes here on, on this, uh, this side of heaven. I have the exact same belief. So I'll dive right in. I also have depression, so uh, I know of what we speak. Let me ask you first, what did you think depression was before you experienced it yourself? Did, were you even really aware of it? Was it on your radar? No. No, it was, it was not on my radar, not even, not even a little bit. Didn't even know the word exists, to be honest with you, but that, back then. Um, wasn't really thinking about it. Didn't really hear a whole, especially back then, you didn't really hear, hear a whole bunch about it, so... No, it was not on my radar at all. So what did you think it was when you started experiencing it? Um, just, you know, somebody who's sad and, you know, having a tough time, uh, going through a tough situation, something like that. But um, obviously found out a whole lot more <laughs> when, I, uh, when I went through it myself and really began to look at the, some of the other things that were happening in, in your brain and the life. Mm-hmm. And this uh, really hit hard during your rookie year, I understand. Yes, it really hit hard my rookie year. There were other things that were building up, um, things that I was, things that I was not doing. I, mean, I was not talking about my feelings. I was not talking about my emotions. Um, I had a lot of anger pent up, uh, frustrations pent up for many, 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 many years, and really was not sharing any of that stuff. And so when all of that other pressure began to hit with, uh, you know, my family, new family, mm-hmm. um, new new career. Um, you know, having money that I had never had before and then not being able to knowing how to really um, budget that. But then again, and I was not talking. Mm-hmm. So it just, all, all those things began to, uh, to take its toll. 
I know that, I mean, you don't have to be a man to not talk about your feelings, but you guys have been almost programmed from birth to not share, to be tough, to be strong, all those things. Did that factor into your not talking? Absolutely. Certain things you are to be tough about, but not everything. That is not what was taught to us. It was, it was not taught a balance. Mm-hmm. It was just taught pain, that's weakness, leaving the body. That's some of the, you know, someone will say. And it's not. Pain is pain. And, you know, when you are going through something, especially when you're younger, and someone is telling you basically su- to suppress it, you're getting taught to suppress pain, to try to hold in something that you're not supposed to. And then we don't talk about it. Nobody talks about anything. So now you go through your you know, teenage years doing the same similar thing and then into adulthood and you pretty much mastered something that should not be mastered. Yeah. Holding in something, holding it in, holding in, holding it in. And, and so, you know, one of the things that I've come to understand is that, you know, pressure, 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 pressure builds in silence when we allow it to. Something Dawkins wishes he'd understood decades earlier is the importance of having what he calls a blessed pack people who support and challenge you, people you stay in touch with regularly, people Brian calls cats you can be vulnerable with. And I would tell my younger self to put people around you that, you, that can speak into you, that you can then talk to to get some of that stuff off, off of you, that you can be real with them. You can be 100% honest with what your feelings are, what your emotions are, what your spiritual state, state is, what your mental state is, and then... What I have in my life is I have people that when, as soon as we finish with those conversations, we're praying together so that we can now, both of us, get that stuff off of our hands and give it to the Lord. That's how I operate. And that's how I'm able to continuously stay victorious when it comes to those things that would try to pull me down, back down into that dark place. So that's what you would say to your younger self. Yes. We are both parents, so I'm wondering what you think we need to be communicating to our children and not just sons. What, what do we need to be communicating to our children so that they don't grow with the same, um, I think, very unhealthy messages we had that, you know, nobody really wants to hear about it or that everybody gets sad. Yeah. So it's, it's that balance I was talking about. There are things that you do need to suck up, like whining and complaining about some things. You need to be able to deal with those things and be able to take a mental mindset that I'm going to overcome my emotions with my mind by having positive things that I'm talking about to myself about, about releasing myself. You know, I'm not giving somebody else um, the right or the power over my thoughts about myself. Mm-hmm. So I, and, and I want my kids to understand, to know that, like, you can come talk to me, especially now, especially that I've come out and I've been extremely vocal about the things that I have gone through and continue to fight. You know, and I, you know just like I know, it's, it, 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 it is a continuous battle, mm-hmm. a continuous battle that we can win, and I am winning, and I will continue to win. But when I ask them, is everything okay? And they say, yeah, yeah I'm good, I'm good. No, seriously, you good? Mm-hmm. You need to talk about something? And they know that I'm a place, my wife's a place that they can come. It's not about being, you know, being judged at that moment. It's about having an ear for them so that we can then, when we're done, go into prayer and pray about it so that I can empower them. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about faith. And if I, if anything yes. in my wording is incorrect or offensive, please tell me so that I can correct it. But I've been to about three conferences. One was called Black Mental Health Matters and another was a, a panel. And a number of people on them said that faith is kind of a double-edged sword, that you, um, a lot of people are raised with the give it to God. And when the it is depression, faith can be a great source of comfort and strength. And it can also perhaps uh, impede recovery if what you need in addition to faith, is a doctor, a therapist, meds, something else. And that some people feel that they had been um, misserved by all the attention on faith when they needed something more than that. Faith, faith is a powerful thing for me. A powerful, powerful, powerful thing for me. But I will tell you this, I will tell you that when I went and talked to um, the doctor, the psychiatrist, when I finally 
you know, with Connie, my, my beautiful wife, and Emmett, who was my defensive back coach, when they told, finally told me I was going. Like, they didn't ask me anymore. They said, you're going. Mm-hmm. And when I finally agreed and, 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 and went, what the medicine did for me is it brought me down off of my emotions. It allowed me to begin to meditate on things that I was, would not have been able to had I continued to go down the path that I was going. Mm-hmm. So what it did, once again, it took me down off of the flight or flight, if you will, so that I can begin to think about things and meditate on things and read my word and read my Bible and begin to pray. And I began to receive more things, answers that I would not probably have had I continued to fight it with my own, with my two fists balled up saying, you can't, you know, you can't win depression. You can't win. Are you willing to talk about how far down depression brought you? The, the, the depression got me to the point where I was not just contemplating suicide. And, you know, you guys probably heard it for the first time at my uh, Hall of Fame induction speech. Mm-hmm. But I was literally and actually looking up ways, researching ways for me to end my life, that my kids and my wife would get the insurance money. So that's how, that's how, that's how deep that I, I had gotten. It was at the point that I could, I felt like I just couldn't take it anymore doing it the way that I was doing it. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't. Mm-hmm. Doing it the way that I was doing it, I couldn't take it anymore. So I had to do something different, drastically different, to get what you've never gotten. Well, most times you're going to do what you've never done. Right. And that's what I did. Something that I never would have thought I would have done. Talking to somebody about my problems, taking medication because of it. I never, there's no way you'd have told me that I would have, I would have done that for a, a period in my life. So while some of us, you know, are able to curl, well, able to, I mean, sometimes it's the only thing we can do, but curl up in bed and deal with the, when it gets really, really heavy and dark, mm-hmm. you were being evaluated you had coaches watching you, your daily performance, and you were going through the worst of the worst of depression. I can't even imagine that. It's a, such a different experience than I had living alone while I had mine. I was putting on a mask. I was doing everything that I could to hide what I was going through. And I got good at it. I got very, very good at it. But the whole time, I wasn't free to be me. Mm-hmm. So I was dying inside because I I had all of these things that I could get out, but I was choosing not to get out. So I was dying inside. But I was smiling, joking, you know, doing all the things, fitting in. But when I got in that car, ride home, in that darkness, in that in that silence, it was brutal. The loud but the voices in my head were so loud. When I would get home, I would sometimes just want to be in a dark room. But I couldn't. When I went home, I still had, I didn't have to perform. I had to put on a good face as best as I could for, for my family because I wasn't talking to my wife about what I was going through. Mm-hmm. So that's, again, that's what began to build and build and build and build because I'm not free to be me. As reluctant as Dawkins was to unmask, he says the results have been liberating. Like one of the, one of the greatest things, like I, I don't have to, I'm not pretending about nothing. So that frees me up. I'm not, un- I'm not under the illusion that I have to be something to somebody or for somebody that's not me. I don't have to act a certain way anymore. I don't have to behave in a certain way anymore unless it's something I want to do. That's freedom. That's freedom. So that's fascinating. I have probably interviewed 200 people in the past two years about their depression. <clears throat> and while some people have said that taking the mask off has allowed them to be more authentic or um, to get help. Nobody's really put it that way. It sounds like you're saying that you have been improved in ways by having experienced this darkness and coming clean about it. Um, that The darkness that you speak of is it's in the same line, I would say, as other uh, traumatic things that we go through in our lives, mm-hmm. pressures that we go through in our lives. I believe those things are allowed to come upon us for us to learn things about ourselves. So you look deeper into what you need to look into to find things deeper inside of you when you go through tough, traumatic situations. Now, I don't wish them on anybody. I don't. 
But when we go through them, I have developed the mindset to, to, to not ask why, to ask what. Like, what is this teaching me? What am I learning from this? What is this showing me? Being aware of the things that you're thinking and why you're thinking about them. Mm -hmm. I've developed disciplines in my life of what I do every day. Two of the most important times, moments during our day is immediately when we wake up and right before we go to bed. What, what are you meditating on? What are you, what, what are you thinking about? What are you, what are you reading? What are you putting into your subconscious? Mm -hmm. What are you consciously aware of? These are the things that we don't think about. And all of these things matter when it comes to <clears throat> having the, 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 the mental makeup to do exactly what I just talked about. Which, with, with those dark times, with those dark moments, with those failures in our lives. And I think that's important for us to recognize because I believe that there are parts of my depression that are whatever, whether that's you know biological, hereditary, chemical, but I also believe that there are things that we can control and your the things you pay attention to and the things you allow in maybe can counter the aspects of it that we don't have control over. And so I, I appreciate you reminding me to focus on the positive and to feed myself positive things, especially as you say, those critical times, like when you start your day and end your day. Any f final thoughts when I know you have... Um, that your time is short and we're, we're at the end here. Maybe just something that you now know about depression that you want to communicate to others so that they don't spend as much time as we both did before we realized we needed to tell someone, talk to someone, maybe take something, whatever. I would say that, first of all, you're worth the fight. You are worth the fight. Your family, they are worth the fight. And there's options out there for you. There's a lot of options out there for you. So being led to go down the path that's going to give you the opportunity for you to share what's going on with you, not feel judged, not feel embarrassed, but to find those individuals. Again, that's why I have my blessed pack. I have those individuals in my life that I can call, that I know that I can call. I can text them. You, got, you have 10 minutes. But when it's all said and done, when it comes to this life, as wonderful as this life can be, you are worth it. You are worth it. Wow. Pressure builds in silence. Is yeah. that ever true? It's so true. And though Brian made the point very well, I want to repeat and reinforce that if a guy tough enough to be nicknamed Weapon X can talk to a doctor, get therapy, take meds if appropriate. There is no weakness in taking care of yourself. No, no weakness at all. It's deep, deep strength. I agree. Absolutely. We'll be linking to Brian's uh, website and keep an eye open because later this year he'll be launching the Brian Dawkins Increase Foundation. Awesome. And if you're lucky enough to be in Jacksonville, Florida at the end of the month, he is going to be putting on a Better Man conference there which will help people, men in particular, become mentally, physically, and spiritually better, which are great goals for us all. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian, for using your voice to help us all to become better. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Bridget. Bye. Bye. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.